In fact, Psalm 1. Psalm 1. We're going to uh, primarily be looking at the first three verses, three points. Early followers of Christ were not known as Christians. That came along later. In Acts 9, you don't have to turn there, but in Acts chapter 9, we read this, Then Saul, that's Saul of Tarsus, who would later become Paul. This is before Christ. Then Saul, still breathing threats and murder against the disciples of the Lord, went to the high priest and asked letters from him to the synagogues of Damascus so that if he found any who were of the way, whether men or women, he was an equal opportunity murderer. he might bring them bound to Jerusalem. They were not referred to as Christians. Again, that come along later. They were simply known as those who were of the way. The way. And <laughs> I thought about this this afternoon. That's really not a bad title. It really isn't. Jesus said this in John chapter 14. He said, I am the way. And he went on to say the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. I am the way. So that's not a bad title. Those of the way. The implication, obviously, is that these follow the way of Jesus Christ. Imitators of Christ. Now, here's why I had you to go to Psalm chapter 1. Psalm chapter 1 gives us three features of those who are of the way. The way. Many years before Christians were called those of the way, the psalmist wrote of it. He wrote of it. So let's look at these three things concerning those who are of the way. What is the way? First, it's a way of separation. It's a way of separation. You in Psalm 1, look at verse 1. Blessed is the man who walks not in the counsel of the ungodly, nor stands in the path of sinners, nor sits in the seat of the scornful. So those who are of the way, they are a direct contrast to those who are of the world. Hence, the separation. First, he or she walks different. They have a different stride. He walks not in the counsel of the ungodly. 
counsel here has to do with advice. Oftentimes we'll use the word counsel to talk about someone's getting married, they come for a counseling session. Given advice. And it can be used in a lot of other ways, but, but it basically means to give advice. And it's what it means here. So those who are of the way, they walk not in the counsel of the ungodly. The ungodly refers to those who are lost. I said a moment ago, this is a picture of contrasts. The contrast between the saved and the unsaved. Now the world can give advice. And I'm not saying everyone who doesn't know the Lord Jesus Christ necessarily gives out bad advice. I've known some people down through the years that to the best of my knowledge, they were lost. But they were very wise people. Very wise people. But you get to a point where you must draw a line. And the psalmist had drawn that line. Those who are of the way Don't depend on the advice of the world. So who does that leave? If you're not going to count on the advice of the world, who does that leave? God. God. So he has a different stride. He walks not in the counsel of the ungodly. Second, he takes a different stand. His stride is different. He takes a different stand. Read Father. He walks not in the counsel of the ungodly, nor stands in the path of sinners. We use that term a lot to indicate someone in my way of looking at it, who is just totally sold out for Jesus. Then they take a stand. Sometimes that stand is not going to be popular. I almost promise you, in contrast to the world, it's not going to be popular. I don't think it's ever been popular with the world to be a Christian, ever. And I think that that's true now more than ever. Christians are bashed. People will do something, say something, and there's no mention of it whatsoever as long as it goes along with the philosophy of the world. But let someone take a stand and say, no. No. And I promise you, depending on where they are, if it's a local person, it may not. But if it's someone who is known nationally, I promise you every liberal media reporter in the business will jump all over it. It isn't possible to live in this world as a child of God and take a stand and not be ridiculed. It's going to happen. It's going to happen. 
I thank God in heaven for the people down through the years that have impacted my life because they took a stand. Again, it wasn't always popular, but they took a stand and they stayed there. There's been some of those people down through the years that I have not agreed necessarily with everything that they propagated, but I couldn't help but admire their stand. And those of the way, as far as their stride is concerned, they don't walk in the counsel of the ungodly and they don't stand in the path of sinners. So he has a different stride. He takes a different stand. <laughs> and he sits in a different seat. Read Father. He walks not in the counsel of the ungodly, nor stands in the path of sinner, nor sits in the seat of the scornful. I couldn't help but think when I read that. What does the world offer? The world offers a luxurious comfortable couch. One of those that you sit down in and it just wraps around you. I remember a time I, I used to be able to sit in those. I can't do that anymore. Back issues will not allow it. But I can't deny the fact that a comfortable seat just embraces you. That's what the world offers. A comfortable couch. You know why? Because the world wants to lure us in so that we will sit in this worldly couch and become comfortable. I think I think one of the problems the church faces today is that so many Christians have become comfortable in the world's couch. I'm not saying they're not saved. No. It's not for me to judge. But they have become comfortable. They no longer take a stand. They have kind of moved, and this is happening all over Christendom. They have moved to a place where they have decided it's easier to just fold and not fight. And that's sad. We look at the shape our world is in. And I'm going to be honest with you. If there is any hope for the United States of America, listen to what I'm going to tell you. If there's any hope for this country, when you look at the oil crisis, the money crisis, when you look at wars and rumors of wars, when you see coalitions coming together, China, Russia, North Korea, when you see all of these coalitions coming together, I got to tell you, the future don't bid good for the United States of America. It really don't. The only hope, in my opinion, that this nation, this country has, 
is to turn back to God. And I'm not going to say it can't happen. God is sovereign in His bestowal of revival. I would never want to limit God. But that's what's got to happen. It's got to be America turning back to God. And I'm going to be honest with you, I, I don't know at this point, I don't know if that could happen. I really don't. How do you describe those who are of the way? They separate. Come out of the world. Be different. Be different. Let me give you a second thing about those of the way. Not only does it have to do with separation, but it has to do with satisfaction. Look at verse 2. But his delight, focus, his delight is in the law of the Lord and in his law. He meditates day and night. There is a real misnomer concerning how the world views Christianity. The world looks at those who are of the way, are Christians, believers, saved, you know what they think? Those poor people. They are living under such a regimented individual that they call God. Who in the eyes of the world is little more than a fascist or a dictator. By and large, that's the way the world looks at those who are Christians. Do you realize, child of God, that the world feels sorry for you? They really do. They feel sorry for you. I mean, you take time out of your very, very busy schedule. And you go sit one, two, or three times a week in a church and listen to some boring guy just go on and on and on and on with the same old stuff. You take your hard earned money and you give it to that church under the guise of a tithe you're given to God. So the world feels sorry for you. Nothing could be farther from the truth. In fact, in the big picture, I feel sorry for the world. They're lost. And if they keep going in that same direction, they're going to die. They're going to die without Christ. And I would never say, you know, people would say, we're going to have the last laugh. No, that's not going to be a laugh. No. Those people are to be pitied. They really are. Those of the way, verse 2 said his delight, those of the way are contented people. They find satisfaction. 
It can be seen in their desire. Look at the first part of verse 2. His delight is in the law of the Lord. Those who are of the way take pleasure in the Word of God. Again, the world looks at the Bible as just an old, worn-out book. They question its authenticity. They will look, they will seek to find error. By the way, they never will. But it doesn't stop them from trying. They read the Bible and they can understand it. Why? Because the Word of God is a spiritually written book. The Holy Spirit moved upon men of old and they wrote. So a lost person is not going to understand the Bible. But those who are saved... It's precious. It's precious. I love the Word of God. The same writer in Psalm 119, which is a long, long chapter, wrote over and over and over, expressing, Miss David, expressing how much he loved the law of God. His love for the word of God. And I have found in my own personal life, you think sometimes the longer you do something, the edge rubs off of it. It's not, as important it isn't you that isn't the case with me I think I've always loved the word of God I grew up hearing the word of God preached I think I've loved it ever since I was a boy but I can tell you I love it today more than I ever have before. His delight is in the law of the Lord. Desire. Second, diligence. His delight is in the law of the Lord. Watch this. And in His law, He meditates day and night. God instinctively builds in to all those he rebirths, those who are saved, a craving to want to know more. I find myself, and I say this not for any other reason whatsoever, just, but just being honest with you. I find myself spending more time in the Word of God now than I ever have before. As a young preacher, I think uh, probably like a lot of others, spent enough time in the Word of God to develop a sermon. To be able to memorize a verse that if someone asks me something I might be able to give an answer that would bring glory to God. But that isn't the case now. It really isn't. Of a night, and my, <laughs> my days are long, <laughs> my nights are short. Because I don't sleep well.
Dr. Nuff wouldn't have anything to do with that, but I spend that time not only developing sermons, which I love to do. I've heard preachers say that's the part of being a pastor that I had not me. I love it. I love it. And I spend, find myself spending more time just reading the Word of God. But it goes beyond just reading. His delight had to do with the desire. But the diligence part is the fact that he meditates day and night. He's like, Wayne, he's like the old cow chewing a cud. The cow chews that cud over and over and over and over. Slowly digesting it. That's what meditation is to me. And by the way, just a little piece of advice, and I think this goes along with meditation. When you read the Word of God, study it. Have you a good cross-reference Bible? Have you some other material? Have you something to where you can make notes, your own personal notes? But stop when you read something, a verse or a passage and just ask the Lord. It's okay. He won't be offended. Lord, what are you saying to me? What do you want me to get out of this verse or this text or this chapter or whatever? I think the Lord delights in that. So the way, those who are of the way, they know something about separation. They also know how satisfying the Lord is. And verse 3 has to do with their situation. I'm not talking about the state in which they are in. I'm talking about where they are, where you are situated. Look at verse 3. He shall be like a tree planted by the rivers of water that brings forth its fruit in its season, whose leaf also shall not wither, and whatever he does shall prosper. Those who are of the way are not left to a life of wandering W-A-N-D-E-R-I-N-G, wandering around. No. They're not tossed about to and fro by the winds of uncertainty. No. They have an anchor. An anchor that is sure. The psalmist speaks of their position in verse 3. He shall be like a tree planted by the rivers of water. I can't think of a tree right off that doesn't need some kind of moisture, right? Some need it more than others. But any kind of tree is going to need some sort of moisture. That's why they have these roots that dig deep down into the ground. You know what they're looking for? Moisture. And there's nutrients as well for the tree. But basically, they're looking for moisture. And I thought, oh, what a contrast. 
before we are saved, the Bible says that we were in a miry clay. You ever read that? Clay, hard. We were mired down in clay. What a different picture for those who are saved. We are no longer in the miry clay of sin that we're situated by the water, by the rivers of water. We've been transplanted, if you will, by the river of life. What a beautiful picture. The position. Then there's the production. The believer brings forth fruit in their season. Those who are of the way live productive lives. Productive lives. A tree that is not diseased, is getting the nutrients it needs, planted by a water source. It's going to grow and if it is a fruit-bearing tree, it will produce fruit. What a picture that is of what God expects out of those who are of the way. We are not only to bear fruit, but we are to bear much fruit. Much fruit. Those who are of the way are not called to sit idly by and put our time in and wait on Jesus to come back. We're to be busy. There is a real big missionary field. Our friend Ian was here Sunday and his wife and they're missionaries to the Philippines. There's a big missionary field there. But there's one right here. Right here in Carter County. A big missionary field. Big. And every time we reach out in some way, whether it be through the church or whether we do some outreach on an individual basis, personally, we extend the possibility of bearing fruit. If you've never had the privilege of leading someone to the Lord, I want to challenge you to try it sometime. I promise you, outside of your salvation and the salvation of your family, it'll be the greatest thing that ever happened to you. It can become habitual. You want to do it more. So the position of those who are of the way, while they're by rivers of water, the production of those who are of the way, they're bearing fruit. And he closes with the prosperity. And whatever he does shall prosper. Whatever he does shall prosper. Several years ago, there was a new vein of 
preaching and teaching that back during the 70s, 80s, back through there, that become real, real popular. There were people preaching what was called a prosperity gospel. They were taking this truth, and this is a truth. I'll explain more in a moment. They were taking this truth about those who are of the, of the way will prosper. They were taking that, and they were going beyond some of the very, very common perimeters that we'll discuss in a second. And they were basically going to a pulpit and saying, God wants you to be rich. How many times I have heard that. God wants you to be wealthy. God doesn't want you to be in debt. God doesn't want you to drive a Honda. <laughs> He wants you to drive a Mercedes. That's what God wants for you. And they would go on and say, the reason you don't have it is because you're not demanding it. Here's the picture. I've heard this so many times. Those of you who remember the PTL club understand this. I've heard this so many times. If you don't have it, it's because you are not demanding that God gives it to you. I have a lot of problem with placing demands on God. A great deal of problem. But they would say that. And it got to a point, and I'll be honest with you, it, it really got so bad that they were saying, now if, if, you're not, if you're not as blessed as you think you ought to be, then you're not sowing a seed. You know what sowing the seed was? Money. Now they couldn't give it to God, so they give it to the evangelist. This is not popular, but there were many of them living in multi-million dollar homes because of the prosperity gospel. I will say this, that's kind of fell apart. So when the psalmist said, whatever they do will prosper, what was he talking about? What you have to do is see how the world equates riches and prosperity. They basically say that the way to be successful in the world is to have all kinds of things, to accumulate things you know some of the greatest Christians I've ever known had very very little as far as earthly things are concerned they had very little some of the greatest Christians I've ever known so it comes down to one of those things You've got to look at it from God's point of view. We look on the horizontal, right? We have a struggle with looking on the vertical. But when we look on the vertical, we're looking to heaven. And we're acknowledging that God is looking at us. 
That's living on the vertical. And here is the problem. God doesn't equate success or prosperity on the accumulation of things. He doesn't. Man views prosperity different than God. Some of those people I told you about a moment ago that had very, very little. They loved the Lord. They served Him. They lived for Him. Those are the ones the psalmist is talking about. Whatever they do will prosper. Maybe not in the sight of man. Probably won't. But in the eyes of God, God considers them prosperous. And I would much rather have the approval of God than to have all of the approval of the world. Amen? I really would. I'm not suggesting we do this, but the term Christian or Christianity has taken such a bad rap in this day. It might be good to just shake up the world and say, I'm of the way. Of course, the world would have some kind of comeback for it, no doubt. Because that could be exploited. The psalmist tells us the way is a separated way. We're different. It's a satisfying way or anything like it. And it's a situated way. I like where I am in Jesus. Don't you? I really do. Let's stand.